Please hand journalist and commentator. Also on the line, we have Sarah Carey, communications consultant and columnist. And thank you all for joining me today. Um, Neil, I'll come to you first on uh, the COVID-19 pandemic payment. A lot of discussion, a lot of debate about it this week. I know on Monday, Minister for Business, uh, Heather Humphrey said it wasn't fair that some people are earning more in the payment than when they were working. Um, Is that the government's view? Is that your view? And should it be changed? Well, I suppose... I think a lot of people have been flagged that this is a payment that is taxable, that, you know, if you were earning less before you went on to the payment, maybe you're on part-time hours, there is a liability with revenue that will come. And ultimately, the payment was brought in in an emergency situation when the government had made the decision to say we need to close businesses, we need to make sure people have to stay at home, but we have to recompensate them. And there were people who were working a lot less and earning a lot less before they got the payment and it it needs to be equaled out and ultimately this payment won't be around forever. It does need to be phased out and as the country reopens we will see the payment kind of decline in terms of those who need to take it up and ultimately it will have to go at some stage. Okay but so at the moment your position is it should be cut for people who were on less than the payment um, before the pandemic No the position is that there's a liability that if you were earning less you know there is a tax liability at the end of the year and ultimately if you've been doing better out of the Covid payment than you might have been doing because you're a part-time worker or something else there is an unfairness there there is an imbalance and that will have to be remedied out as we go through the year. Remedied out by the government? Well, I'd imagine revenue will have something to say, but also tapering off the payment is a big part. Tapering off the payment. OK, Paul, what do you make of that? Do you believe it should continue, that the full €350 Euro a week? I do. I think the idea that there's some unfairness in the fact that people were previously on poverty wages, and Ireland has a scandalous problem with, with low pay, that there's an unfairness in people who were previously on scandalously low wages now going just to the poverty line. That the idea that there's a a problem with bringing people up to the poverty line, I don't see what the problem is there. And I think this agenda, which is very clear, and I think... Sorry, I I will just interrupt you because it's not about people necessarily um, earning us, it's about people who are working part-time. You know, it's, it's, it's not about people but, earning but, less for a full week. But, it's about people but, who are working part-time earning. Sure. In the example we heard yesterday, €100 Euro a week, now getting €350 Euro a week. Sure. And uh, the majority of those who are part-time workers are women, a significant majority. Um, many of them are not part-time because they want to be part-time. They're not necessarily the students or whatever. They're people who can't get full-time work. They're doing their best to scrape by. They're currently below the poverty line. They've been brought up just about to slightly... They're still slightly below the poverty line, but closer to the poverty line by this payment. And I don't think we should be cutting it. And I think that in, in the interview you did yesterday with Pat McDonough of Supermax, I think we saw where the drive to cut the payment is coming from. And the government is, is going to go for this. But it's about these low pay employers, people who take you know, lunch money out of their minimum wage employees. Okay, we're not here to discuss Pat McDonough now because sure. he's not here but, to defend himself. Sure, well, he's, he should come back on to defend himself. He should come into the COVID committee and defend himself. But in, in any case, the point is these people want their employees back in working for extremely low pay. Okay. Instead, we should be raising the minimum wage. We should bring it up to the living wage as a step towards 15 euro an hour. And therefore, people can have a decent living standard. OK, Sarah Carey is also on the line. Sarah Carey, Paul Murphy thinks the full 350 a week should be continue to be paid, um, regardless of what you're getting paid beforehand. You know, it's really interesting, Sarah. I dug in deep into this last night, talking, uh, looking at the figures to do with low pay and poverty. So Paul has said a few things there, that if you're in low pay, then you're on the poverty line. In actual fact, the numbers show that not to be the case. It's this really strange phenomenon. There are more low paid employees in the top 40% of households than the bottom 40%. And when you look at the groups of people who are at risk of poverty, bizarrely people in low pay only constitute barely 6% of those. The people who are at risk of poverty in this country are people who are unemployed. So it's a question of no pay, not low pay, or people who are disabled. So you don't expect that to be the case and you wonder why it is. And the reason is when you look at the pattern of employment in households. So a typical makeup would be, and I hate generalizing and stereotyping because, you know, every house is different. But what it really looks like is that you would have somebody in a house, say the husband, and he has a pretty good job and is doing okay. And then the wife might be the second earner in the part time job, do her two or three shifts, maybe. Or you could have two adults in the house and you have a young adult then at home, the son or daughter, and they're in a part time job. So it's really strange and that there's actually a very weak connection between being in a low-paid job and a risk of poverty. Okay, I'll let, pa- that- I'll let Paul back in on that, Paul. 
I don't think that's accurate. I think that Sarah no, is, it is generalizing. No, it is accurate. They're, they're all the stats from the CSO, the ESRI, the OECD. So the, the, let, me, let me come back on it. The, the poverty line yeah. for households with one child, one adult and one child, is about €370. Euros. So if you're a single parent uh, with one child and you're on the €350, Euro, you're on less than the poverty uh, line still. If you're a single adult, the poverty line is about 290 euros. Their figures... You would also get additional benefits there, Paul, as well. And and that's the point which demonstrates... You can't just say that that it's 370 and you get 350, but then you're not including, well, if it's a lone parent, the lone parent allowance or the entitlement to child benefit as well. You can't just pick and choose the facts to suit the argument. But that's exactly the point with those figures, okay? Because right now we're subsidising low pay. Say for, take the example of Supermax right now, people are back at work, the state is paying for the vast majority of those wages. But that actually happens to some degree outside of pandemic time as well. The state subsidises low pay to a significant degree. And that's what the government is using to manipulate the figures. This idea that 200,000 people are better off as a result of the pandemic unemployment payment is precisely because those figures are based only on PAYE. They're not including the fact that people are on working family payment, people are on child benefit, people are are on part-time job seeking allowance, etc. Yeah, that's actually a really good point you've raised because when you look at the stats for what countries are more unequal than others, there's this really amazing thing whereby in the OECD, after tax, Ireland is one of the most unequal societies. We redistribute an awful lot of income from tax and give it to people who are poor. And before tax, we're one of the most unequal. And why is that? And again, it goes back to it's not people in low pay. It's that Ireland has an unusually large number of people with jobless households. There are households where no one has a job. So we're giving money to those households just by all those payments you've just mentioned, Paul. But of course, you don't want to be in that position. You want to be in a position where even before tax, you don't have this group of people who are making us an unequal society. And I think what the conversation this week has been about low pay, but actually it's distracted us from where the real poverty is and the real inequality is. And it's those people without a job at all. Okay, do you want to very briefly respond to that, Paul? And I want to bring in Lise. Yes, but I think this idea that those who are currently on, say people who are previously unemployed, who are still unemployed after the crisis, and they're only getting just over, say as a base payment, just over 200 euros a week. I don't think they're clamouring for people on 350 to be brought down to them. Instead, I think we should say, look, 350 is the basic minimum that people are required to survive, really, and therefore we should be raising the, the basic social welfare payments to that level rather than trying to level them downwards. We should be leveling them upwards. OK, Lise, what do you make of all this? Because this is has been a big issue for the government and it doesn't look like it's going away anytime soon. No, it doesn't. I mean, this was a payment, obviously, that was brought in um, at fairly short, at very short notice to deal with a very you know, a burgeoning crisis. It was very much a catch-all payment to deal with the sudden, you know, the employment dropping off the cliff across the way. And of course now the problems, inherent problems in the system and the inequities and so on, naturally they're now bubbling to the surface. And um, I think it has sparked a debate about what is a living wage and what is a minimum wage. And I think that is probably a good thing um, because, it, you know, this has really forced the issue, whereas before it was a very piecemeal discussion and it would come up here and there. Now, because everybody, so many people are under this umbrella, it really has brought it to the fore and I think it's a timely debate. Now, I think it's interesting as well that, you know, the Taoiseach did indicate that this payment will probably have to be extended because this is, you know, we're still, it's an un, we're still in the middle of this. It's still uncertainty. Um, but of course, he did also, uh, you know, indicate that this would be a problem for the next government. Mm. So it may very well that this rather um, messy situation will land at the on, on the lap of perhaps Taoiseach Michal Martin, and he might be all the happier for that. Yeah, because uh, some of our listeners are not that impressed. Uh, Neil, we have Arthur here texting in on five one double five one saying, "I know three secondary students." who had weekend jobs for €100 Euro approximately. They are now enjoying the emergency payment of €350 Euro each. It's crazy. Yeah, and look, I'm getting representations on both ends of the spectra- spectrum from employers, from parents, from many other people with this anecdotal evidence. But ultimately, where we have a situation is the government insisted that people had to stay at home and stop working. Now, hopefully, we'll be able to move through the reopening phases. And as we move through the reopening phases, this payment becomes unnecessary when people, when the pandemic isn't stopping people going to work anymore. Okay. And that's where we have to move for it. And that's why it's Actually, fair to say it'll go on okay, through sir, the next stage. Of the yeah, just one, yeah, well, yeah, just one more quick point on that. I 
I think the government were aware that when they were up in it to the 350 that they would be overpaying some people. But they took a view, look, this is helicopter money. We need cash in the economy quick. So they knew that they'd be, some people will be taking a huge drop in their income, but they weren't going to mess around on means tests for the people for whom it would be an increase because we'd get it back anyway when they started spending it. Okay. Um, Neil, I want to ask you about the one metre, two metre social distancing debate that's going on at the moment. Um, a lot of talk about it, a lot of pushback on it. Uh, Fianna Fáil's Jim O'Callaghan yesterday saying he thinks it should be brought down. Has the government lost control of this narrative, do you think? No, far from it, but we're moving from the different stage of the pandemic now. We're moving out of it. We're reopening society and economy. And understandably, people want to speed things up. Under employers want to be able to make sure they can get more people into their businesses, be it a restaurant or otherwise. Do you, you think it should be sped up? No, I don't. Well, I think if the science allows for it, to absolutely. But I think the two metres for now is the right thing. That is the medical advice. And when you look at... So, sorry to interrupt you, but as long as the public health advice is two metres, you think the government should adhere to that? Or at any point, you think they should break away from that? No, I think they can break it away if it allows for it. But we're not in that stage of the pandemic yet. The advice is quite clear that when you are two metres away, there's a 99% chance of not getting the pandemic. When you bring it down to one metre, it's a 70% chance. That's why it hasn't moved to that. And until we have the virus you know, a lot further under control, there's a lot less reproduction rate and measures that way, we can't force the issue. And I think it is absolutely premature just to be saying, look, let's just drop the two metre for one metre. It'll make everything much easier. It may th- make things much easier, but it does create the risk of bringing back a surge. And the last thing anyone wants is the last 10 or 12 weeks of sacrifice that everyone's been through mm. to be for nothing. And there is so much work. confusion over it now, though, Neil. I mean, we had Joe McHugh, the education minister on this show yesterday, saying that the schools couldn't come back if it was two metres or even one metre that not all children would be back at school. I mean, you know, it it is integral to every part of life, isn't it? Absolutely. And that's why we're in an element of a fortunate position that so many other countries on the continent and other places got the virus before we did and they're further along in terms of their reopening and we see what approach schools are taking in Denmark has been vastly different to schools in other parts of the EU and we can learn from that example and make sure we are in a position to open schools in September in the best form possible for protecting the students, yeah. the teachers and the parents. I think there's a lot of confusion over what exactly is going to be happening in September at this point. Uh, Paul, what's your, what's your thoughts on the one metre, two metre? Yeah, I'm for following the public health advice and if the public health advice is clearly that the two metres is substantially safer than one metre, well, then we should stick with that. And I think we should look at where the pressure for easing for two metres to one metre is coming from. The suggestion is kind of given, and the Taoiseach gave it during the week, that it's coming from the public, that the public wants a quicker reopening, etc. But it, it's not. I mean, Fianna Fáil in particular are marching to the tune of the Vintners and other lobbying associations. They're not marching to the tune of the public. The Department of Health do opinion polls on a weekly basis about people's attitude to the lockdown. And 81% of people think the social distancing measures, which includes the two metre, are about right. 8% think they're too weak and only 11% think that they're too strong. So the vast majority of people support the continuation of the two metre and you know, Fianna Fáil in particular are just bowing to each pressure of lobbyist groups that come out and say it and we, we shouldn't sacrifice people's public health for the interests of private yeah, companies. Fianna Fáil's not here but I'm sure they're rep- they would say that they're representing the, the views of businesses you know, and they're as valid as anybody else's views. Um, Sarah, your thoughts on this? Yeah, I see. Paul makes a very good point there that, you know, on the one hand, I'm on the Internet half the day looking at Twitter and what journalists are saying and what's in the media. And there's this huge pressure coming on to speed up the lockdown. And yet, as Paul points out, the people are actually happy enough uh, with the way things are going. Now, some critics have said, well, who's been asked? Is it people who are still on full pay and, you know, who are kind of not doing so badly in lockdown? And if you ask employers and people who have lost their jobs, they're going to give you a very, very different answer. So my position on this has been that I've huge sympathy for people in leadership positions and responsibility that if they speed up lockdown and we have another surge and people start dying, they will be severely held to account for that. And it's very different to have an opinion when you're the likes of me writing it in the column, you know, or coming on the airwaves to say something versus being at the table and holding people's lives in your hands. So while I'm personally frustrated and I know in particular people in businesses who are really, really suffering and really want to get their lives back and also actually not just from an economic point of view, from a mental health point of view and children out of school, particularly disadvantaged kids or children with special needs, this is damaging them. But 
you know, I, I, I can't, I find it hard to judge the politicians harshly when they're the ones who have this decision in their hands. So yeah, it's a tough you know. one, Lise, isn't it? Because um, this sort, of, this debate sort of originated out of nowhere last weekend, didn't it? It popped up, and it has really gained a lot of traction since then. Yes, it has, and I mean, as Paul pointed out, it's kind of almost like the front line between the the sort of. I'm not going to say the war, but the sort of the tussle, we'll say, between what the medical vice, uh, the, the, the stance taken by the government and then various group groupings or sectors such as education sector, um, hospitality, obviously, and even Dublin bus were out yesterday saying, look, the two metre thing is unworkable on our buses. And what happens when retail opens up and an awful lot of people are going to be either going into work, you know, commuting in, in out of work, in out of businesses? It's not sustainable. So again, a bit like the COVID payment where you had this sort of one size fits all that was introduced very quickly. It could be very well that they will have to take a more nuanced approach if the, they are to lift, lift, lift the two metres. It may be that they'll say, OK, we could make the one metre work in these cir- circumstances. But if they do, it might be a thing of uh, free uh, masks will have to be made for, uh, available, uh, freely available mm. to anybody who is going to be mm. working the one metre thing. So again... Everything was sort of crashed into place, but I think maybe the, the coming out of these various things might be more nuanced and might be staggered. And what do you think about um, how much in control the Taoiseach is of his cabinet around all this? Because we're hearing that there's quite a lot of disagreement in cabinet around it. Yes, I mean, there is, because obviously a lot of the, of the cabinet will, will be being very, very heavily lobbied by various people who are understandably anxious to, to make a living again. And, you know, also I think it has to be remembered that this is sort of a gate fever, cab, cab, you know, if there was lockdown for gate fever, they'd all be in isolation by now because, you know, this is a cabinet that they're all looking at the door. So they're trying to, they're, the, the unusual constraints of knowing that they're going to be working together for the next six months or three years has to a certain extent gone. So they feel that they need to get, you know, get their own spake in as quickly as possible before a new government is formed. Okay. So the whole cabinet discipline really is pretty shaky at the oh. moment. Yeah, although, sorry, Sarah, do you mind if I come in there? Yeah, briefly, I'm Sarah, not alarmed. I, I'm not alarmed when I hear about disagreements at Cabinet. Like, that's what we should no, be No, I'm certainly not about. alarmed by it. I mean, it's yeah, I'm just making I'd, the point that more, the discipline yeah. is less, you know, is less rigid then because they know that they're coming to the national end of the government. Yeah, yeah. But, uh, you know, I, I, the, what we should fear is groupthink. You don't want everyone on the same page. And if and if they're having a good old discussion with people on each side of Cabinet so that everything is being teased out, I think that's fairly healthy, to be honest. OK, but, Paul, I want, I, want, yeah. I want to move on because we've got a couple of other topics I want to get to. Um, nursing homes has been another big one of the week, uh, Paul, with a lot of accusations being levelled at the state and state agencies that nursing homes were abandoned. What's your view of it? Yeah, I think they were abandoned to a large degree. That's what comes out of the minutes and so on in terms of an absence of dealing with this problem that was was there. Nursing Homes Ireland for all the criticisms that I'd have them in terms of, you know, association of private operators and so on were saying that this was a problem, um, were calling for help and then basically didn't get it. Um, I think that it speaks to fundamental problems in terms of the model of nursing homes that we have, like a, a huge problem in terms of like the so-called vectors of the coronavirus between nursing homes arises from the fact that huge numbers of the people working there are agency staff, are working in poorly paid agency staff, working in multiple nursing homes, living together and then spreading from one to another. And so it, it points to the need, in my opinion, to establish a you know a nursing home model as part of a national health service, property funded, etc., as opposed to this patchwork system that we currently Neil, have. they were abandoned? I think abandoned is probably a bit strong. I think there's certainly many things that need to be learned from it. But if you look at the fact that there was over 400 <coughs> items of correspondence and you look at the reaction that has come in terms of the now where we have in terms of provision of testing and equipment and PPE and all that. And also when you look at the comparisons to other countries, nursing homes and retirement facilities across the world in every country have been hit harder by this pandemic. Yeah, we're one of the yeah. worst. Well, again, but that comes down to the anomaly of well, what figures are you using to count. And we have been so assiduous in terms of our counting the numbers of actual cases mm. and indeed, sadly, deaths. I remember we saw in Northern Ireland when they weren't counting deaths mm. from, from nursing homes and care facilities. I think there's certainly But you say to it's a bit from. too strong to say that they weren't abandoned. But I mean, if you had nursing homes who had to buy painter's overalls and goggles to put on to try and protect themselves and their patients or residents um, during the height of the pandemic, is, is that not abandonment? No, obviously we had at the height of the pandemic a global shortage of PPE where the state was having to charter planes to go and 
pick it up themselves from China and thankfully we're a part of the EU that we could collectively procure. It was an extremely difficult time and you mentioned very individual cases that of course I'm not saying that mistake weren't make and we can do this a lot better but I think abandoned is far too strong a term. Please. No I mean I think they were left swinging in the wind. I mean I do have a personal interest in this. I have a family member who's in a, a resident in a nursing home and um I have to say, this particular nursing home, um, Ashford House and Dunleary, they are the gold standard. Um, they went into lockdown incredibly early, put in unbelievable measures to keep the, everybody safe and have come out the far end, HSE tested with not a single case among uh, mm. residents. And if the HSE or NFET are looking for somewhere, they could l- look at that um, as an example of working pra- good working practices. But um, I think that if you look at the, the model, um, ev- all the focus was on the acute hospitals. Um, they were the focus and really the nursing home, whole, all the private nurses' homes were basically overlooked. Um, but I think just to... to Broaden it out slightly, I think that this will be a very timely uh, time to actually look at the whole model of nursing homes. I mean, the reason that quite a lot of families resort to nursing homes is as a last resort because the the structures and support structures to keep a family member at home aren't there. They're either inadequate or they're all siloed. I mean, you know, trying to get home supports elicit so many phone calls, there's inadequate numbers of people to look after, say, you know, to come in and offer the home supports, and people then have to go to nursing homes. So, I mean, this could be a time not just to look at putting in structures to prevent a second wave, but to actually look at the whole care for the elderly and, you know, look and actually put the emphasis back to trying to to put the, the, the structures in place to keep people in their home longer as well. Okay, Sarah, your thoughts on this? Yeah, I agree with Lise very much on both points she's made there. The first is, so I was doing a count last night, I think there are 571 nursing homes There were clusters in 257. So there were no cases, I think, in 314. I hope I've got that right. So the majority of homes didn't get it. Now, was that good luck or was that good practice? And it would be really interesting to see what we could learn from that. And then, yes, Paul Cullen in the Irish Times and Professor Roseanne Kenny, the fabulous gerontologist, have been making this point that there are a lot of people who get put into nursing homes when they could stay at home for a bit longer if they were getting more support. And I've been writing columns for about 15 years and I've always said this was the circle that was never squared when women went out to work. Women did all this vast unpaid labour looking after children children and looking after the old and no one's ever figured out how to pay for that and and let families continue to function in any kind of normal way mm. so it's forcing us to address that um so and just one thing though i would like to say there's been a lot of blame storming going on but i was reading this morning in the irish independent the managers of the small nursing homes that got really hammered where like up to half of their patients died I feel so sorry for them. You know, uh, like these are people's homes. There was one in Ballyshannon where they had 22 residents and 11 died. And I think one in Clondalkin where they had 31 and 13 died. Like, can you imagine what they're going through watching yeah, the residents die like that? So so All I know right. we want accountability, but I would say, you know, let's go easy while we try to figure out what happened. This happened across the world. And I don't think anyone willfully neglected, you know, old people. It, okay. it was It was a shock. Yeah. Okay. Okay, um, I want to talk now about uh, breaking the lockdown and people in authority being seen to break the lockdown. Um, the most glaring example, I think, of this <laughs> that this week being Dominic Cummings, and I do want to talk about him, special advisor to the Prime Minister, Boris Johnson. Uh, but first, there's also here back at home, Neil, um, allegations that her own teacher, Cleo Varadkar, broke the lockdown rules by being too close uh, to some of his friends when he met them uh, in the in the Phoenix Park. I, I think it was last weekend or... Yeah, it was Sunday afternoon. The Taoiseach and his partner who lived together went for a picnic um, and some exercise in the Fings Park within five kilometres of where they're living with two friends who lived an equidistant away. And there was pictures taken in their own personal time and videos taken and put up with very unsavoury and nasty comments on the internet. You'd have to question that practice. But the Taoiseach has been quite clear. He broke no guidelines on a rare hour that himself and his partner, who is also working on the front line, let's not forget, they have their privacy invaded and people trying to make out Mm. and compare them to a flagrant breach of recommendations by Dominic Cummings in the UK. I think it's very unfair. I think we have to be... Sure, I know you're saying his privacy was invaded, but he went to a crowded Phoenix Park on the Sunday. He took his shirt off. 
but he so, also, I mean, people are going to look and take pictures when, when also a Taoiseach does that. But he also um, didn't break the regulations. Well, that's why I just want to ask you about because there had been guidance not to go and have picnics and that's what he went and did. And there was advisory and people are entitled to go out within five kilometres of their home to get some exercise, to get some fresh air and make sure that they adhere to social distancing. Sure, obviously, but on the picnics, the there had specifically been guidance from, I think it was Liz Canavan, not to go and have a picnic. Yes. Don't don't, don't linger and have a picnic. And that's what he did. No, so, well, he was, a picture was taken of him having a drink with friends. We don't know had they just finished a run or a walk. I think it's a little bit much to stretch that when you have someone who drives up and down to Durham and trying to say that it's the exact same and the same people who always have it in for the Taoiseach have jumped in it with glee. OK, Liz? Well, I think there was a false equivalence there. I mean, the Taoiseach didn't come down with the virus, drive to Galway, you know, walk <laughs> up and down, shop, uh, shop you know, shop check, street. Check his down. eyesight. <laughs> yeah, check, yeah, to check his eyesight, call into his folks on the way home. You know, I mean, they're, you know, it's a false equivalence to, 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 to match the two. And, you know, I think the, the, the thing about the Taoiseach, I mean, the fact that it was a one, you know, it, it got a bit of traction, but I don't think most people really were buying it. I mean, they, if they want to hold the Taoiseach to account uh, regarding coronavirus, they'll do so on the actual issues rather than him just hanging out in Phoenix Park. Paul, do you agree? I, I, I generally agree, yeah. I mean, I think the only issue that people had, the people who were reasonable about it had, was that um, some ordinary people were, like, kicked out of parks and so on in the preceding weeks. And, do you know what I mean? People need to be able to access parks, need to be able to access green spaces. I think that's that's reasonable. I mean, the only element of the story that I thought there's some clarification further needed is this thing about where he was living. Because the it's, it's within the five kilometres of Farm Lee, but I think on the radio he had previously said he was living in Blanchardstown. But presumably that he's actually living in Farm Lee, I don't really yeah, think Yeah, he's within is. the guidelines. Sarah, your thoughts? Yeah, I agree with everyone else. And maybe just on a lighter note, um, despite his torso being tanned and toned, I'm not necessarily sure I'd have taken my T-shirt off in public if I was uh, in his place. But, you know, the man is entitled to his privacy, even in a public space. I know there's no legal entitlement to that. And I think most Irish people agree with that. Like even, you know, you're mentioning Dominic Cummings, however nasty a character he is, it's really quite intimidating to see people crowd outside the homes of British politicians politicians, which they do all the time. And I'm glad we still have some sense here, however abusive it can be for a politician, you know, in the public sphere. Your home is your home and you do have some privacy. So okay. I hope we stick to that. Uh, yeah. Yeah, very briefly, if you don't mind, has Dominic Cummings survived, do you think? Unfortunately, I do think he has. He has. All right. Well, thank you all for joining me uh, this morning. That's Paul Murphy, Neil Richmond, Lee's Hand and Sarah Carey. It's just coming up to 12 o'clock at time to have a quick look at the headlines this afternoon. 